Do you ever have problems with other people in the church? Just asking. Does it ever bother you when you see folks who claim they're Christians, not, not living up to the same standards that you have, not living their lives in the same way that you might think is the right way? You know, I'm just asking. <laughs> During my senior year in high school, my relationship with my hometown congregation was pretty rocky. In the first place, I was a senior in high school, and I felt that I had all the answers to the important issues of life. I think that's pretty much uh, a malady that all youth that age face with called senioritis. In the second place, some folks, some friends and I had started a Bible study together, and we were really getting into that study. We were finding all sorts of answers to the problems of life that now we were more than eager to share with anyone who would listen. And as we saw it, not nearly enough people were listening to our wisdom. And I know that both my mom and dad and my pastor were getting pretty tired of my ideas of rightness and righteousness by the time my senior year came to an end and that summer was over. And they sent me off to college in the fall with smiles of relief on their faces. <laughs> now don't get me wrong, those were good times. Those were great times of growth and understanding in my personal life of faith. At that time, the faith was new to me and I was enthusiastic and eager to learn and Absolutely everything that I saw about faith at that time was the most important thing at that moment. Sharing the good news was important. Prayer was important. Enthusiasm and worship was important. And even though I'd grown up in a good, solid congregation, boy, there sure were a lot of things that I wish those folks there would change so that they would finally get it right. I looked around at worship services and I saw that there were folks who didn't pick up a few Bible and follow along with the pastor read scripture. I was appalled that people didn't even bring their own Bibles along with them. It galled me that page numbers of the scripture reading had to be printed in the bulletin should these people know where these passages are found. It bothered me that not everybody sang the hymns, my dad included, or concentrated when praying. And I, how did I know that? But I was always concerned that not everyone in person, every, not everyone who was in present in worship was a part of a Sunday school class. What was wrong with all these so-called Christians? Did you ever do that? Did you ever take time to check out what other people are doing during worship to look and see if they're singing? My dad liked to use that time to look around the congregation to see who was there. He might mumble the tune, but he wasn't singing the words. Or if they close their eyes during worship, or during prayer time rather, or bow their heads or fold their hands. I think lots of us do that. We do it during worship. We check each other out at other certain times in our life together. And when I did it, when I checked those things out, I noticed that folks in my home church seemed a lot more concerned that the service ended exactly one hour after it began. <coughs> They were more concerned about that than they were about the actual act of worship that they were involved in, if you can imagine that. Because if they'd really listened, I thought, then they would have seen things my way, and then they would certainly have begun living a lot better lives during the week. Can you see why my folks were counting the, the, the days until I left for college? And all those people in church as well. You know, some of the people in the church bothered me. Seemed like there were lots of hypocrites coming there to worship. People could barely talk the talk, let alone walk the walk. Do you ever make judgments like that? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but <laughs> as you said, put your head down on your desk and raise your hand when you ask to see. Have you, ever, have you ever thought of yourself as better than others when we come here into God's house for worship? I think one of the things I really struggled with in the worship service in those days was the prayer of confession that was printed in the bulletin, like ours is here. At the time, I struggled with the words that I found in prayers of confession that had been written by other folks. I didn't mind praying in confession. I knew I was a sinner. I didn't admit that to people who give it a chance. But what bothered me were the kinds of sins that were often listed in those prayers. I felt that sometimes they didn't apply to me. Maybe you feel the same way on Sundays as we share that prayer and say, geez, I'm not that bad. 
It was hard to pray those prayers some days because they weren't my sins. I was beyond that. Well, now I know better. It seemed to me that I was doing most all the right things. If there was anything going on in the church, I was there. Why weren't others doing the same? Is any of this sounding familiar to any of you? I know that many of, out, of you out there have been there, that you've been faithful, that you've been generous with your gifts, that you've worked hard, not asking for anything in return. And like me all those years ago, you've realized that God needs many workers. Like me, you knew too that all of your efforts together make a difference. And we don't come to that spot with any particular sense of being prideful. We are aware of our sins. We know that we need God's grace, that we need God's forgiveness. And we believe that our lives would have no meaning at all without the love of Jesus Christ, that He is truly the source of our salvation. One of my favorite hymns, Amazing Grace, speaks to that truth as we sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Oh, my other favorite hymn, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Those hymns, verses of those hymns are reminders. They're all saying good stuff. They're the foundations of the gospel, but sometimes we can easily misuse them. They can be songs and lyrics that allow us to feel good about ourselves instead of words that can penetrate and pierce our hearts and call us into attitudes of repentance and change in our lives. We know in our heads that those, what those words about God's grace mean, but in our hearts, in the way that we live and interact with others, sometimes we don't give a clue that we appreciate their meaning. In other words, by the way that we act and behave, we show that we really don't understand who we are before God and how we are supposed to get along with one another. So with all that long lead-in in mind, let's hear again the Gospel reading today, the parable that Jesus told. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, which one of the two guys in the story would best describe you? Okay, you put your head down and raise your hand. <laughs> you know, it's, it's one thing to thank God for what God has done for us, for all those blessings we've received, but it's something else again to compare ourselves to one another and to thank God for the differences, like somehow we are better than that poor, miserable tax collector over there, better than that neighbor who might drink a little too much, or that clumsy idiot we work with, or the guy who sits next to us in church, and it seems to have no real faith at all. But don't we all do that? I don't know about you, but I suspect that most of you do. Since that heady time of my senior year in high school until now, I still catch myself being critical and self-righteous, wondering why, oh why, can't others see God's truth as clearly as I do? Or sometimes being bothered because others claim to see a truth that's different and even more clearer than the one I'm embracing. And that sometimes is just as difficult. And I kick myself for that because I know it's wrong. Why, oh why, don't we get over that? Why do we do such dumb things? We know it's wrong to lift some folks up and put others down. It's wrong to claim a higher measure of God's grace or a closer relationship to God than others who don't know the truth as well as we know it. We know that way of looking at life is fraught with problems. But that's what sin does in our lives. Sin has power and it works in divisions and it works in our pride. 
and it makes wrong look right, it makes right look wrong. And as long as we have a breath, we'll be fighting that power in our lives. And we'll be fighting to follow God and in forgiveness in Jesus Christ as we do battle. And we'll be fighting even as we fail. Are you familiar with the Jesus prayer? It's a short one sentence prayer that is designed for you to easily repeat as you have time with God through the day. And, and it's a simple prayer to re repeat three times. It simply reads, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. And it comes from this gospel reading today where the tax collector, the scum of the earth in his day, beats his breast and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, those are words to live by. Those are words that we can let mull in our minds to work over again and again and again. There's a beautiful promise in today's gospel lesson. And here it is. All those who exalt themselves, Jesus says, will be humbled. But all who humble themselves will be exalted. That's a promise that God gives to us. But it's also a challenge. It's a challenge because we have a tough time not lifting ourselves up even if that means putting someone else down. It's hard not to think that somehow or another I'm a better person than that person over there, that tax collector, that sinner, that arrogant person, that cheat, that hypocrite, that lazy person, that liar, that dominating person. The list can go on and on and on. We don't have to think that we have the right, the one right answer. That because we do this or that thing better or more often than others, that somehow we're better people, that somehow we're wiser or holier than other folks. I think Jesus would just shake his head in that way of thinking. And so Jesus challenges us. Don't think that because we work hard at serving God, that we attend worship more than most other people, that because we've attended this conference or undertaken that study, or have somehow we become more important or more faithful or more loved than other people by God because of it. Jesus challenges us and says, don't think that because we work hard and pay our taxes and refuse handouts and because of that we're better people than immigrants from the third world or politicians or big businesses or people on welfare. And let's see what other flags I can throw up as I'm preaching this morning. Because Jesus says, all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. There's an old Jewish Hasidic saying that goes like this, the person who thinks he can live without others is mistaken. The person that thinks that others can live without him is even more mistaken. Of all the gifts that God gives to us, I think that humility holds the potential to bring about the greatest change in the way we live our lives, in our relationship with God and with one another. And here to say right now that I think humility is the greatest gift that God has given to me. That's just go that. I want to see if you're listening this <laughs> Friends, apart from God, we know that we're nothing. And yet God has given us everything simply because God loves us. Everything we treasure in life is contained in that simple statement. That God has given us everything because God loves us. And stewardship is all about how you and I choose to share that gift, the gift that opens all the other gifts in your life to be used and shared to God's glory. It's a simple truth. May God give us all the strength that we need to live out that truth in our lives. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me? Our Lord and our God, as we come before you this morning, our hearts are open to your gift of love, your gift of grace, your tender touch that reminds us that you received us and accepted us, even when we've done nothing to deserve it. And that, O Lord, is a source of true humility in our lives. That while we were yet sinners, your Son, Jesus Christ, died for us. 
We thank you for that gift of mercy. For its breadth and its depth and its meaning for us. And we offer ourselves now to you in Jesus' name.